today's episode of the podcast is part two of my special two-part series covering the Wine and Spirit Show 2019. The first part of this, episode 259, featured Coravin founder Greg Lambrecht taking us through a Coravin blind tasting test. While today we're in the capable hands of Patrick Schmidt, MW. He is editor-in-chief of the drinks business. And today's tasting and presentation is entitled Drinks Trends of the Century. In it, he illustrates his major trends of the century and includes examples for the assembled audience to taste along. For reference, I've included all of the details of the wines that we tasted on the day below in the description. And I can highly recommend seeking these out and tasting along as you listen. Enjoy. Thank you very much to all of you for joining me. My name is Patrick Schmidt. I'm here presenting a very personal selection of wines this afternoon. Uh, who the hell am I? Um, hi, I'm editor of a magazine for the drinks trade, the alcoholic drinks trade called The Drinks Business, um, and some other publishing projects as well that I won't give you a lot of detail on. But essentially, we are, as publishers, we are the organisers of this event that you're all here at today. Um, and it's great fun for us because essentially I spend the whole time commenting on issues in the trades and dealing with wine professionals. And I'm sure you all are extremely professional in your approach to wine. Um, but it's fun for me to work with consumers rather than the trade because it's a very different approach. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to hopefully take a pretty a professional approach to this afternoon's tasting. Um, but the idea is to have a bit of fun and enjoy what's in front of you. And I'd say we've got a really good selection of, um, of wines this afternoon. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. It's a bit odd. I, I thought I'd use the microphone this time. Last year I just shouted and I did one mask class after another after another. Then I went out on the usual kind of mopping up the leftovers. Then I had to do the same thing on Saturday. And by the end of it, I was incapable of speech for about two days. So I thought I'd use the mic. It's a, it's a, it's a bit weedy of me. Um, so what have you got before you and, and, and why have I chosen these wines? Essentially, the idea came from the fact... I'm going to give you a bit of a plug, but it won't mean an enormous amount to you because most of you are consumers and therefore you don't read the trade uh, magazines on the, on the drinks industry. But as I said, I edit a magazine called The Drinks Business and last month we hit our 200th edition. Uh, we're a monthly magazine. We've been going since 2002 and I worked out that with about 100 pages an issue, we had printed around 200,000 pages of information on the wine business. And not me personally, but across that, written about a million words. And that excludes our website. And we do at least 10, 10 stories a day on the news. Do you know what? I'm going to just shout at you. It's annoying. It's driving me crackers and hearing myself. So I'd realised that we'd produced all this content over the past 17 years. And I thought, how to celebrate it? Well, I'm not just going to write a piece saying how wonderful we are, because normally when people start reading that people promoting themselves, normally there's a sign that something's terribly wrong. But also, it wouldn't really entice our readers. So I thought, well, let's look back over those 17 years, and I'm going to limit myself to 10 trends, 10 key defining developments that have really marked those 17 years, those 200 issues. And for each one of those developments, I will choose a wine. And that was the idea of a big feature that I wrote a month ago, and you can read it on thedrinksbusiness.com if you want to. But then it came to the masterclass here, and I thought, well, let's use those wines, let's use those trends as a reason to show you wines I love today, but each one tells a story. And what I want to do today is I want you to look at the wines, I want you to enjoy the wines, and I'm going to tell you the story behind each one of them. And I think that's also quite, I hope it's quite a fun way to do it, because there's something a bit annoying about tasting something and then people telling you what it tastes like, and you're having your own experience. So what I'm going to focus on is the story behind these wines, but you are free and I want you to taste them and assess them yourself. And also say is, while you're tasting them, do ask me my opinion if you want, or do put up your hand, or do shout out, or whatever it is. Uh, and I do want a bit of interaction from you as well. Uh, nothing, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but just be interesting to know your thoughts on the wines. Now, we're going to kick off with an English sparkling wine. And uh, this isn't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to mention Brexit, we're not going to talk about it. Um, and this isn't like chosen out of some sort of element of nationalistic pride. 
Um, this is really chosen for the simple but very important reason that when we launch the drinks business, if you go back, we basically deal with this century. So let's say from 2000 onwards. Okay, we launched 2002, but let's keep it simple. We go back to the start of the century. Even if we went back five years, English fizz was seen as really a bit of a cottage industry, a bit of a niche, you know, some slightly eccentric land, landowners, you know, either in West or, or Southeast UK. Uh, in fact, there's some quite good sparkling wine made in Wales now as well. But basically, they thought, well, I've got a plot of land. I love wine. Let's try making it. And the results weren't always great. In the last few years, English sparkling wine has become a serious industry, professional, branded. There's some big names in it. There's some big money in it. There's now some big production in England as well. Last year's vintage, remember what the summer was like. It was unprecedented conditions. We had the best vintage on record ever in the UK. It was similar in Champagne as well. And as a result, we produced a lot of wine. At the moment, the story with English sparkling, just from a business perspective, it's really a production story. The demand isn't there yet. Um, but the reason for that is because the production that was produced in the last vintage, you won't be seeing for a few years' time in the market. And that's because English sparkling wine is made primarily in the champagne method. You're not allowed to call it that. It's the traditional method, but essentially the champagne method where the bubbles are produced in the bottle in which it's sold. And to create a creamy style of fizz, you need to age those bottles. So the fruit that's coming out of the vintage last year, you won't see in the market for at least two years. Now, how many people have drunk English sparkling wine before? Okay, what, okay, this is a really good sign. <laughs> if I'd done this last year, I'm sure it would have been far fewer. I mean, they've been the royal weddings and various kind of things going on that have developed a bit more interest. You know, Waitrose as a retailer has been a big uh, proponent of English sparkling. It's, they're more readily available. So maybe that's not a surprise that, what, four-fifths of you have. Um, how many of you buy it on a regular basis? Okay, rather fewer. And does anyone want to offer me an opinion on English sparkling? Does anyone think anything? Does it... Does it create any ideas in your mind? I, I ask that because there's, there's quite a famous wine writer called Stephen Spurrier, um, and he's invested. He's got, his wife has a beautiful farm down in Dorset, and he realised that he had these lovely chalk, south-facing slopes like you might find in Champagne, um, because we have similar geology to, to that you find over the other side of the channel. And he thought, let's plant a vineyard. I'm a wine writer. My wife has the land. Let's do it. It'll be fun. And um, he said to me that since he started producing a wine, it's called Bride Valley, he goes around to a lot of trade fairs and half the people say, that is delicious. It's crisp, it's refreshing, it's everything I love in sparkling wine. The other half say it's too acidic. And that's why I wondered, because English fizz, we'll try it, and I'd be interested to know what you think, can be a little bit sharp, can be a little bit tart. Um, but on the other hand, some people's tart or sour can be other people's refreshment. And we'll maybe discuss that a bit more when we get to Sauvignon Blanc. This, I'm not going to talk too much about the wine. You can make up your own mind. Happy to answer any questions. But I selected this to showcase English sparkling wine uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, they say you drink with your eyes. And I think that is a really fun, funky bit of uh, packaging. I mean, English sparkling wine sometimes looks a little bit dull. It's certainly memorable. Um, Whiston, the other reason why sex is Whiston, they've got, they're using the best winemaker in the UK, a guy called Dermot Suguru. He's their consultant winemaker. Um, has anyone heard of a wine called Nightimber? Yes. Right, so years and years ago it was associated with that, and it's a very famous brand, but he really is the guy who understands how to make English sparkling better than anyone else in this country. Obviously, there are consultants from Champagne and elsewhere coming across and helping us. Um, and also, because there's been a lot of money invested in this, the people behind Whiston... Does anyone know the Goring Hotel? Yes. Right, OK. Well, the people behind Whiston own the Goring, uh, which must be a nice little money spinner. I'm, and they probably have the freehold as well. Um, and they have a little farm of a few thousand acres in Sussex. They love wine. They thought, let's plant some vineyards. And what I can say is that if you're in that position, they're not a particularly showy family, but if you're in that position, you do things properly. You don't necessarily do it as a businessman with a three to five year plan for an ROI. And they have got the best winemaker. They've got the best packaging designers. Uh, they've got lovely sites for the vineyards and they are doing it really properly. And I think it's a very, very nice example. And it's a bit niche. I could have shown you not the obvious. We've got some Gusborne in the other room, which is lovely. Night Timber is a great sparkling wine. It's a great story. It's a great brand for England, but it's everywhere. 
The last thing I would just say on the trends perspective is that um, UK sparkling, English sparkling as we call it, um, has been around for a bit. And I said it gone from kind of cottage industry to being a professional branded industry. It's only really recently that's starting to be exported. And I think there's this whole thing at the moment about British drinks. And I'd say it's part of a bigger trend of a real appreciation for British drinks worldwide. Um, I spend a lot of time in markets outside the UK. We're a global publication. We have an office in Hong Kong. I know that when I go to Hong Kong, they've kind of seen it all before. They've drunk every style of champagne. You're never going to outdo them on fine wine. But they're interested in quite often things like craft gins from the UK. Obviously, scotch has been around for a long time as a very fine spirit. Um, and they're really interested in English sparkling. And, and brand Britain outside the UK has a bit of a kind of cachet at the moment. I'm not quite sure why, but it, <laughs> it does. Um, so it's the new thing. So it's quite interesting. And I think in the, in the wine industry, we talk about emerge or uh, drinks business, we talk about emerging modern classics. Um, and I think English sparkling is becoming one. But let's not spend too long on it. Let's move on to the, to the stuff that I mentioned earlier, champagne. And I think it's quite nice for you guys and for me to be able to see side by side English sparkling next to champagne and particularly, I think, quite a good comparison to see English fizz alongside what is a very dry style of champagne. So hopefully you will see on your notes that this is called an extra brute. Uh, does anyone know? Does that mean anything to anyone? So it's even more brute than brute. Brute being dry... An extra brute being basically half the amount of sugar in it than brute, and even lower. They actually say the official is between 0 and 6 grams per litre of residual sugar. I don't want to blind you with numbers, but this has two. It's got barely, barely any sugar in it at all. It's almost bone dry. And the Whiston, in contrast, probably has about 10 grams per litre, to give you an idea. Now, the perception of, of sugar, of sweetness in sparkling, is quite different from in wines because you naturally have a very high acidity and then you have a sparkle, a fizz. And both of those things clean your palate. So you don't really detect sugar normally. You don't normally de de detect sweetness in champagne. But there is a trend for very dry champagne, particularly in this market. The UK historically was, in fact, the country that drove the whole style of champagne towards Brut. Historically, champagne was very sweet. I don't know if you've uh, have ever read about some of these bottles of champagne that they unearthed from the 19th century, from kind of deep, deep in the, in the Baltic Sea, for instance, quite often shipments on their way to Russia, to the royal family. Um, if you have read about them and you see, and they quite often report in those notes, that the, su the sugar content may have been like 150 grams per litre of sugar, now, that will mean nothing to you, probably, because it's just a number. But to put that in perspective, Chateau d'Iquem, famous Sauterne, famous sweet wine, that has about that much sugar in it. A can of Coke has about 110 grams per litre of sugar in it. So they were drinking champagne that was sweeter than Coke in the royal family in Russia in the 19th century. It used to be seen as very smart to drink very sweet drinks. Now it's seen as very sophisticated to drink very uh, dry drinks. So it shows you how fashions change. And the real trend at the moment is towards very dry forms of champagne. My issue is with dry champagne is that I think all wine should really be a pleasure to drink. It should be generous. And I quite often find that very dry champagne, it's taken some of the pleasure out of the product. I like the creaminess. I like the richness of champagne. I don't want something that's hard and, and tight and taut. I want something that's generous and creamy. But we discovered at the drinks business this new champagne called Rimoncourt. It's a new brand. It's launched in 2009. <clears throat> and they make this extra brute, and I had it in a blind tasting, and for me it was a real revelation because it was one of the few really dry champagnes that I discovered that I thought was lovely and creamy and balanced. But you decide for yourselves, and there it is. And Diogo, who's at the back, who represents Brimon Call, they, you've got to stand here, right? Yes. Yeah, so you can go and see some of the other champagnes from Brimon Call, uh at the stand in the other room. And, and to give them a bit of a plug, but because I believe this, it's quite fun to find a completely new name in the champagne world. It's very hard to launch a brand into champagne because it's, it's such a, a crowded, competitive sector dominated by one particular company in, in, in the form of Mert Hennessy. So it's quite fun to find something new and very brave of them to launch into that category. Now, the third wine, so your third glass, but the second champagne... 
Um, the reason why I chose champagne, I, you may be thinking, what's the trend here? The reason I chose champagne as one of my, my trends of the century, effectively, is because champagne has be- been proven to be so resilient. So when I started in the wine trade around 2002, champagne was uh, suffering from what they called the Millennium Hangover. And basically, if you remember the Millennium Celebrations, you know, whatever you did, one thing that everyone was expected to do was to celebrate with vast quantities of champagne. And therefore, the Champagne Noir produced an enormous amount. We were the leading importer, still are by volume in the world of champagne. And they, sh- they produced a lot of champagne, shipped a lot of it into the UK market, expecting us to drink, as Brits do, to pretty r- impeccable, <laughs> large, <laughs> uh, you know, extent. Um, we should be proud of it. And, um, and, and there's barely any alcohol in, in champagne anyway. Um, anyway, we didn't. We didn't drink that much. We didn't drink as much as expected. Uh, we didn't do the usual thing and get absolutely plastered on champagne. Maybe we switched to other things. I can't remember what happened. I was probably drinking beer then. Um, but as a result, there was a lot of champagne stock knocking, in the mar- knocking around the market. For the next two years, sort of 2001, 2002, there was all this discounting and the world of kind of real discount fizz, discount champagne uh, was born. And it did a lot of damage, really, for a long period of time to the image of champagne. Um, champagne then clawed its way up, reached a peak in 2007. That was when it peaked in the UK market. Then we had the global fr- financial crisis, remember, 2008, October 2008, Lehman crash, the GFC as it's called now, and champagne crashed again, fell right down in this market. Then it's clawed its way up again, and now it's tailing off a a bit again. But what we've seen in champagne is a region that has survived. We go back into the previous century, two world wars, the oil crisis in the 70s, the recession of the 80s, the dreadful recession in the early 90s, the millennium hangover, the big overstocking of 2000, then the GFC of 2008, and then the modern day trend, which is really causing a bit of a headache for the Champenois, which is English sparkling and Prosecco and the global rise of competitive sparkling wines, but also declining disposable incomes, coupled with rising prices in Champagne. But what I would say is it's been a really resilient category, and it's a really interesting product to look at to trace drinking trends. But it's The reason why it's resilient now is because of champagnes like this. So I hope you've all tried it. Um, If if, if you love other sparkling wine, please embrace the world of fizz. People are a bit set on, like, it's got to be either champagne or Prosecco. There's a whole world out there. But they're both great and very different products. But within the world of champagne, there is a lot of variation. And I don't want to talk about the makeup of the industry and all my loves and hates of the world of champagne. All I want to talk about is what I think is a really good value uh, house and style of brute non-vintage. And that is this one, Charles Heisek. It's not cheap, it's quite pricey, but I think it's good value. In, a, in effect, uh, d- have you heard of a champagne house called Krug? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. So Krug is very famous. It uses a lot of older uh, wines and, and, a, and a blend across a big span of vintages to create something that's very rich and honeyed and deep and nutty and toasty and all sorts of flavours that you'd probably associate with champagne if you read the likes of Jay McQuitty and people regularly. Anyway, not to knock her, I think she's great. But anyway, um, Krug's story is complicated by the fact they use oak barrels, but let's forget about that. Charles Heidsick, Krug is about 110 quid a bottle. Charles Heidsick is about 45 quid, right? And it's made a little bit like Krug. A lot of wines from across all different vintages. It doesn't have the oak influence, um, so there is a difference there. But what I'm saying is it's a very rich, very honeyed, very complex, very toasty form of champagne that, for me, is relatively affordable. It's good value relative to its peers. I think it delivers a lot of bang for the buck. It's a style of champagne I particularly like. And I mentioned earlier about champagne, I think, giving pleasure, being quite rich, in contrast to maybe an English fizz, and I think Charles Heidsick does it well. Does any, do, 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 how many of the room have heard of Charles Heidsick? Okay, quite a few, that's good. So next door is their sister house, Piper Heidsick, that's a bit more affordable, hasn't got as premium an image as Charles Heidsick, but is making also exceptionally good and very good value champagne. But I love, I love Charles. Okay, so the next wine, I'm not drinking these, so I know what they taste like, but also I don't want you to listen to me slurping, and I think I've got a something recording what I'm saying so I don't want it to pick up on me salivating Um, but the next one I'm really excited about this is something I've been championing 
since it was launched really in 2006, I think. So it's a bit over 10 years that it first hit the market. And it marked my next big trend of this century, which I suppose I would kind of call, call posh pink, the rise of luxury rosé. Um, I think you've got prices there. Um, so <laughs> when, when, I, when I launched, right, when I launched, I say I launched, when I started work on the drinks business, um, when I started working the wine trades, when I started getting interested in wine, um, pink wine, rosé was a bit of a joke. Uh, it, a lot of it was sort of, you know, sweet, slightly darker coloured style of rosés. People were talking about white Zinfandel, the blush wines of California that really increased the market. Um, I didn't view rosé as a particularly serious wine. And certainly even professionals until very recently didn't view rosé as a fine wine. What do I mean by fine wine? I mean something that, for me, gets better with age um, and that has complexity and layers and, and, and all sorts of things that make it um, something you want to keep, something you want to share, and something you actually want to trade. Anyway, Rosé wasn't playing in that sphere at all. This came along, 2006, Garus, and it was a game-changer. Um, what's interesting about it is that it's actually made like a fine white burgundy. So... If you question yourself, why should the fact that it's pink not mean it could be a fine wine? In a way, why were we so close to that idea? We just were. It just had an image. It had a frivolous image. This came along and said, we're going to make it like a fine white wine, but it'll be pink. It's very, very pale pink. And we'll see what the market thinks of it. And we were blown away, I have to say. It, it's, an, it's a wine that I've probably had more fights about this wine than I have had about any other. So I don't expect you to agree with me. I'm sort of ready to take anyone on. Um, some people say rosé should be light, um, easy drinking, youthful, crisp, clean. What are they doing making something that's rich, that's creamy, that's nutty? Um, it just doesn't fit in the category. I don't agree with them. I think this is a great wine. And I think you should judge it as just a great wine. Forget it's rosé. But the reason why I chose it was to, to show the fact that, that rosé has entered the luxury world of wine... And that there are now making really, really fine rosés, which I think is very exciting. And don't assume that just because it's a different colour, it can't be a great wine. And the other thing I, reason why I chose this wine is because rosé now has become very smart. It's, it's fashionable, but it's also almost got a cachet that kind of white wines would quite like. So actually the most expensive rosés in the world are champagne. And if you look at the very fine prestige cuvées in champagne, always the more expensive variant is the pink one. Um, and it's hard to make a really pale rosé with this much flavour. You need very little skin contact with the red grape, so it's actually very skillful. It takes a lot of technology to make this as well. I won't bore you with the details, but it really technology has helped create these wines. Um, can, I just get, can I get a show of hands? Does anyone think that's delicious? How many people think that's delicious? Okay. How many people aren't keen? Fine. Okay, they're always going to be... So like, if you're really used to those quaffable light rosés, if you like very dry, very light, youthful rosé, you might find this too much. This is bone dry, but it is very rich. Yeah. What grapes? Uh, so this is made with Grenache, primarily Grenache, 80-year-old vines. It's from Provence. And a little bit of what they call roll, which you may know as Vermentino, which is a white grape grown down in, in Provence. Um, but primarily Grenache. And the best rosés in the world tend to be made from Grenache. Actually, a Spanish grape called Garnacha. It's one and the same. Um, but performs brilliantly in the Mediterranean. Makes lovely strawberry-scented reds and rosés. Um, so, yeah. And we're, we're, we're actually really lucky. I, I feel privileged. This is my wife's favourite wine, by the way. I told her I was presenting this today, and she wanted to get rid of the kids, so she'd come down and just have a glass. Um, but we're, we're, And I said, no, you, what are you going to do with them? Um, but... Um, but we're really lucky to have this because it's been such a success. It's a total sellout. And we approached them and said, can we show Garris? And we thought they'd say, it's from a producer called Chateau d'Esclan. We thought they'd say, no, you can show one of our other rosés. But they said, no, you can show this. It comes in a big, heavy bottle. And it really is, it's, it's, it's very hard to get hold of. So I'm very pleased to be t having it today. And it's kind of once a year I have a sip of this wine. It's always a good moment. And how much does it cost to buy? Uh, it should be on your sheet there. 110... 100, it's the most expensive, right? It's the most expensive wine in the lineup, which I think says a lot because you'd expect that to be a fine red or a champagne, but it's not. It's a rosé. 
So that wine is telling, that's the story uh, connected with that wine. Okay, so. Am I going to have to get out the mic? I might have to. The fifth wine. Save, save, me, getting the, save me getting the mic. Um, Chardonnay. Right, okay, this is another grape where I have to get out the boxing gloves. Um, how many people have come across a term, used the term anything but Chardonnay or ABC? Well, there you are. There's ABC. Okay, there's another, another reason to use it. Right, okay, I, I'll ask you what you think of this wine in a minute. So there has been a backlash against Chardonnay. It's actually come full circle, I'm very pleased to say. The backlash was entirely justified um, based on a small number of wines that were quite dominant in the mainstream markets. But today, those wines are hard to find. Chardonnay, I just want to remind you, is probably the greatest white grape you'll lay your hands on. Some people might say it's Riesling, but of the noble grapes for me, Chardonnay is the greatest. Um, and there are two reasons for that. One is the great wines, still wines that produce. Second is its versatility. Uh, we talked about champagne earlier. Do you know a style of champagne called Blanc de Blanc? Yes. Right. Blanc de Blanc is very popular at the moment. It's partly why I'm saying Chardonnay is coming full circle. Because Blanc de Blanc champagne is champagne made with Chardonnay. Okay? Um, Montrachet, Meursault, Pouligny Montrachet, Chablis. They are all wines made with uh, Chardonnay. They are all wines that are hugely popular in this market. So some of the great fine wines of the world, from Champagne to White Burgundy, but also beyond, are based on this grape. So it can undoubtedly make very fine, very nuanced, very elegant, very complex and interesting whites. The problem was is that it was also used... I think there was a feeling, right... We all said, right, we've got these wines. We've got a wine like Merceau. People love it. It's popular. We can sell out. We put Merceau on the label. We charge people 50 quid. They don't even question it. They buy it, and they say it's wonderful. It's sophisticated. What people were buying into was, it, was what Char- uh, Chardonnay was giving them. They were buying it as Merceau, let's say, for an example, which was a kind of textured white wine, quite a rich white wine with flavours that were really, really appealing. So like some stone, stone fruit, like, talking, like apricots, things like that, peaches. And then uh, a freshness, a balance, so like lemon, citrus. And then some of these flavours that come from winemaking. So things like butter, buttery flavours, uh, bready flavours, toasty flavours, vanilla. All sorts of flavours that you put them together in a wine glass and they are delicious as long as they're in balance. A bit like cooking, a bit like a dish. You want the flavours in balance. You don't just want to taste one thing to the detriment of everything else. I think what happened was that commercially minded people, particularly in places like California and Australia, said, right, wine drinkers like that style of white wine. We know they like buying things like Merceau. Let's give them something, but let's pimp it. You know, let's enhance it. Let's enhance everything. And just raising everything up, raising the volume, turning up the amp, didn't actually make for a pleasant result. It actually made something a bit sickly, a bit confected, a bit tiring to drink. And I think that's what happened. So I understand the motive. That was the result. And as a result, people, there was a backlash. They said anything but Chardonnay because they, they didn't like these very rich glasses of wine because they weren't refreshing. Now we're getting refreshing Chardonnays again. And it's gone from ABC in the last century. It's gone from ABC to CCC we say in the trade, which is anything but Chardonnay, to cool climate Chardonnay. And one of the big changes that's come with Chardonnay is that those people that planted a lot in the New World, in places like California and Australia, also Chile, South America, um, New Zealand, have gone to cooler climate locations. So it's making a crisper style of wine, so more lemon than apricots naturally makes your mouth salivate. It's a nicer glass of wine. We drink white wine to refresh the palate. We drink all things to refresh the palate. So that's really one of the reasons. So cool climates, so coastal locations and higher altitudes. And then, of course, picking a bit earlier. If you pick grape early, if you know you pick an apple off the tree earlier in the season, it's green and tart at the end of the season. Well, in the UK, normally it's fallen on the ground, it's rotten, uh, unless you know what you're doing. But it's sweeter. And it's the same with grapes. Pick them early, they're tighter, they're fresher, leave them longer on the vine, they can go overripe. Um, so you've all hopefully tasted... I picked this because Australia was one of the countries that was particularly picked out, Chardonnay being its emblematic white grape. Australia was really picked out for being um, the... Oh, gosh, what would I say? Um, 
the, yeah, the most guilty, that's the word I'm looking for, I said the most guilty when it came to very rich styles of Chardonnay. So I thought we'd look at the style today. And this is from the Adelaide Hills. Um, and they, the combination of great Chardonnay, old vines, cooler hillside locations. Uh, it's a lovely place to visit. And they're making lovely Chardonnay. This guy, um, he's a master of wine. He makes a guy called Kim Milne. He's a brilliant winemaker. And Nest Egg is the brand. This, again, you're very lucky. They, they produce a very, very limited number of these wines. They're all numbered. Um, and the producer is called Bird and Hands. But this is his Nest Egg Chardonnay. And, uh, and it's great. I think it's lovely. So it has got some of the carrots I talked about, some of the toasts, nutty flavours. But it's fresh. It doesn't... It doesn't tire the palate. I can go back again and again and again and have another glass, and that's really the test of a good wine. Does anyone still not like Chardonnay? Okay. And, and what, can you, just, so I can understand, I know it may be embarrassing, but tell me why, be as brutal as you like, tell me why you don't like it. I just think it's too strong. Yeah. Too strong. Too much flavour. Okay, I completely understand. So, I drink, uh, particularly after tasting a lot of beer, a lot of lager. Uh, I right taste, blind taste a lot of the world of uh, craft lagers, drink a lot of IPAs. But actually, quite often, I want something inert, refreshing, cold and alcoholic, like just a, a bottle of Heineken super chilled. And I know exactly what you mean. So sometimes that's the case. A white wine can have too much flavour. It's often the... Riesling is a great variety I mentioned earlier that's a kind of darling of the wine trade. Consumers don't like it. I understand why, because often it has too much flavour. Yeah. It's all... And, and it becomes divisive. Um, something with it. Uh, you know, then it, then it comes into its own. I think that's very true. You don't necessarily want to drink a whole bottle of that Chardonnay You're right. without food. So this is a really good point from the front here, that actually these wines you're tasting aren't designed to be drunk in isolation. They are designed to be drunk with food. Designed to open a bottle, sit down, and work your way through it with something to eat. And in fact, pretty much all wine is made with that in mind, particularly fine wine. So I think that's an extremely important point. So in a way, we're analysing it to see if we like the flavour combination, but you would have to imagine drinking this. Just, just have a packet of salted crisps. That's all you need to do. That's the best test. And, and sometimes the wine sort of like explodes and becomes something yeah. It changes. Uh, so, sorry, someone at the back wants to comment about the Chardonnay. Yeah, what, what were you going to say? I d you, no? You don't like it? But why? Why? Do you want to say why? Or what? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you might look, like, look, I, I write about all types of drinks. You might look at Scotch, Isla Maltz. You know, are you a, a lowland or a highland? Are you an Isla? You know, what style of, of malt do you like? Um, again, with cognacs, do you like a more floral style or do you like a very rich kind of Hennessy style, chocolatey style? Everyone has their own personal opinion when it comes to drinks, so that's totally fine. But what I'm saying is that Chardonnay has evolved into something that I think is in a really good place today. Um, and that's the story with that wine. So, wine six. Good, the last of our whites. So this masterclass, as I told the organisers about two days ago as they were rallying around, wouldn't be complete without a Sauvignon Blanc. No. Uh, you might say the same about Pinot Grigio, but, um, but Pinot Grigio is a big story, but we're going to tell a different Italian story at the end. OK, so Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this is the other big story, I think, of this century, well, I don't think, I know, and I think everyone would agree, or I know everyone in the trade would agree. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, its home, its origin, its source, um, is really, you know, parts of, of France, Atlantic coast, Bordeaux, the Loire Valley, associated with white Bordeaux, is based on Sauvignon. But your famous wines of the Loire, Sancerre, Puy Fume, they are made with Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc was really associated with France, uh, certainly at the start of this century, maybe really, probably the 90s it started to really take off in the new world. But it has become a global phenomenon. There is not a wine region in the world that doesn't have at least ex a few experimental rows of Sauvignon Blanc. And I challenge you to go to a restaurant or a wine bar that doesn't have a Sauvignon Blanc by the glass. I know of one that made a bit of a statement by not having it on their wine list, and it was really a bit of a PR stunt. 
And actually, because Sauvignon Blanc has become so prevalent, it's come in for a bit of bashing, which a bit like Chardonnay is unjustified, although there are guilty players that have caused Sauvignon's reputation to drop a little bit in this market. But the real story behind Sauvignon is in this glass. It is Marlborough in New Zealand. They managed to create something with Sauvignon Blanc in that part of New Zealand that really kind of enlightened everyone. It refreshed palates. It was something totally different. It was green. It was bright. It was vibrant. It was pungent. It was instantly recognisable. That's a really key point. When you stuck your nose in one of these glasses, anyone could, and, w- could say what it was. And it made everyone feel a bit like a wine expert suddenly as well. You know, it was such a nice feeling. Um, so it was, it, they knew, people knew exactly what they were getting, and it was just so, dist- and it was so memorable. Um, and there are many reasons why it's successful, and it was rightly so. But I think New Zealand now is in a very good place. It's making stunning souvenirs like this, and I wanted to show this to you because I think it's a lovely example. But there, was, there has been a slight move against some of the very green styles of Sauvignon. Someone here mentioned go- gooseberries. Someone's very grassy, nettly, um, very kind of like green styles of wine. It comes into mind things like peas and asparagus. The famous term used to describe Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc was by a wine writer called Oz Clark. <laughs> and it was in the, maybe it was the late 90s, and he said it was smelt like cat's pee on a, a gooseberry bush. Um, and I, it, it, a lot of the wine writers talk about boxwood. If you've been to like those National Trust pro- properties where they have parterres, <laughs> you know those little gardens where everything's neatly clipped hedges? And if you brush against the, those hedges, it's called boxwood, it gives the smell of cat's pee. So a lot of people talk about those green boxwood ar- aromas. Lemongrass is another common description for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Anyway, very, very identifiable flavours. I think a bit like Chardonnay, they went a bit too far. It became a bit too green, a bit too off-putting. Also, there was a stage maybe about 10 years ago where every single stand-up drinks party was New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. You might then say that came the, became the case about Prosecco. You might say today it's the same about very pale roses. But people did get a bit tired of it. I know that my wife has a real issue with Sauvignon Blanc as a result. Um, So I do understand that. But this is different, I think. Someone said at Gooseberries, for me, I get a lot of pink grapefruit, which is really nice and really refreshing. It reminds me of kind of um, hotel breakfasts, which is the only time I ever drink grapefruit juice because so many sort of mid-range hotels that I have to stand around the world have kind of orange squash in the mornings. They just have kind of sweetened concentrate. But the grapefruit juice is normally quite nice and refreshing. So it reminds me of... Okay, so it reminds me of Hotel Breakfast, which I think is a nice flavour. It's refreshing. It's also quite a rich style of Sauvignon, so I want you to see that as well. Um, It's got a bit of barrel influence, so they're making this Sauvignon using some of the techniques that you might apply to making Chardonnay. That rounds it out. It gives it a bit more texture. And it also means that, like this lady at the front made that very good point about food, that it's a Sauvignon that goes very well with food. And if anyone's interested, um, something that people quite often say... Um, goes well with Sauvignon is goat's cheese but actually it's more the other way round if you're serving goat's cheese rather than having a glass of of Sauvignon thinking I've got to find some Sauvignon Blanc to go with it if you're doing quite often it's like weddings lots lots of friends and friends of friends getting married always emailing me and saying I'm having a wedding what shall I serve and quite often they start with goat's cheese Again, it's a bit like Sauvignon Blanc. It's kind of everywhere. I'm a bit tired of it. But, but anyway, if you're stuck with goat's cheese, a Sauvignon Blanc, particularly a rich textural style like this, is a really good thing to have because goat's cheese, for some reason, makes a lot of whites and particularly reds taste a bit metallic. I don't know why. It's quite a bitter, mouth-coating cheese. Uh, so bear that in mind. I think this would be great with goat's cheese. I'm not a sommelier here to do food pairings, but I'm just thinking of a use for it. Um, do you think Chenin Blanc I would love to agree with you. Someone's, the question is, has Chenin Blanc taken over? Uh, Chenin Blanc is another white grape from the Loire, uh, particularly famous in Vouvray, also in Mont-Louis, and in South Africa. Um, I don't think it's well-known enough, and I don't think there's enough supply, I don't think it's globally pl- planted enough to ever challenge Sauvignon Blanc. But it's a really good place to step onto. If you like whites from the Loire, 
you like very crisp whites, you're looking for something different from Chardonnay and Sauvignon, Chenin is a great wine. Very, very good with food, but quite often, particularly in France, made with a little bit of residual sugar, so a bit of sweetness, which is fine. It balances the, the acidity and the, the sugar acid balance means that it's still refreshing, but quite a honeyed style of white wine. I love them with food. Um, they can be a bit divisive on their own. There's a famous appellation in the Loire called Savignier, and they make these lovely kind of, they're like um, honey-coated apples, sort of crisp but also quite rounded. Anyway, but I, I don't want to talk about Shannon because it's not one of my top trends, and I've just had someone telling me off for going over time. You can talk about that later, but a very good question. Okay, the reds. So it's mainly a white wine tasting today. I think that's right. A lot of the trends, big changes, big swings have taken place in sparkling and white wine this century. But also because this is a, a late afternoon, it's a wine fair, and I didn't want to kind of load you up with a load of very heavy reds. But, yes? Why do you place white above red? No, I'm not placing it above. I'm not, it's just more of my trends are in, in, in white wine. And as I was saying, it's easier to taste in in the, it's just, just the way it's worked out. Uh, I have done tastings just on Cabernet, just on Pinot, just on Syrah. It's just the theme of today. Okay. And these are the wines I could get. So, um, yeah. Well, you, I've done, I haven't done too badly. Uh, but yeah, any complaints in writing? Um, but uh, so, Pinot Noir. Uh, has anyone heard? So, story on this one. Drink the wine, enjoy the wine. The story on this one. Has anyone heard of a film called Sideways? Yes. yes. Okay, right. Uh, who hasn't heard of a film called Sideways? Okay, so it was a bit of a surprise Hollywood blockbuster. Uh, launched, released in October 2004. Okay, so quite a while ago, but it falls within this century. And in it, there's an actor called Paul Giacometti, but he plays this character called Miles. Uh, they're basically on a, uh, kind of before this guy gets married, they're doing a tour of, of the wineries in California. And he does this, like, eulogy about Pinot Noir. And he just basically bangs on about how it's the most perfumed, wonderful, holy grail of a grape. In the same film, he says, if anyone serves fucking Merlot, I'm leaving, when he's about to go out to dinner. As a result, Merlot didn't drop off a cliff, but it did decline a bit but what really happened was that Merlot because that film was such a surprise hit because it was really a story it was a great story actually it wasn't a story about wine but it was really focused on wine and wineries did an enormous amount of positive PR for Pinot Noir and between 2005 and 2015 so a decade period which is the only time I've really measured it plantings of Pinot Noir in the uh, in the US and California went up about threefold so supply increased, demand increased. Pinot Noir became a really global phenomenon. So I was talking about Sauvignon Blanc, once being really rooted to the Loire in France, and then being planted worldwide. The same thing happened with Pinot Noir. Rooted in Burgundy, for those that don't know, red Burgundy is made with Pinot Noir. Then became this great phenomenon where it was planted all around the world. And I chose one from Chile um, to show you what New World Pinot Noir is like, but to show you a newcomer to the world of quite fine Pinot Noir. So this is pricey. Not quite Chile's most expensive today, but when it was launched, it was Chile's most expensive Pinot Noir at about £40 a bottle. And it's also to show you what a lot of New World Pinot Noirs are like. They tend to have, if you're used to drinking red burgundy, they tend to have slightly sweeter, richer fruit, a little bit darker in colour. In the early days, they were accused of being a bit too jammy. I think this is a balanced wine. Um, you can smell and taste a bit of toasty oak, new oak on it, as you would expect in fine red burgundy. Um, but it just has... I used the word pimp earlier, if you imagine kind of um, taking a... A, a, a Ferrari and adding big wide alloys and body kit and things to it. It's a bit like that. It's like taking a, it's like taking a fine red wine from France and sort of boosting it. Um, and that's what I think what you get with these types of New World Pinots. But Chile I'd pick because I think it's also providing some quite good value as well. Um, I'd love to show you the great um, Pinots from Sonoma, cooler climates, Sonoma in California or Oregon. Um, but they're a bit harder to find in this market, and they're often very expensive. Has anyone had Chilean Pinot before? So actually, the best-selling Pinot Noir in the UK at the moment 
is called Connoisseur. And they have this bicicletta Pinot, and it's at about seven or eight quid. And it's the best-selling Pinot in the UK market. And it's actually really quite good Pinot for the price. I think it does a good job. Um, so Chile is, is a place to look. But that's a fine example of Pinot Noir from the New World. <coughs> OK, uh, last red. Um, again, I think no story of the century or wine of the century story would be complete without Malbec. Um, how many people drink Malbec regularly? Okay, so it's everywhere, and rightly so. And we do a lot of blind tastings, and particularly between kind of 8 and 15 quid, Malbec delivers a lot of value, a lot of reliable, consistently good, juicy red wine. It's really associated with Argentina, which is why I wanted to show you this, in the way that Sauvignon is associated so strongly with New Zealand. Does anyone know the origin of Malbec? Thank you. So it's actually not... They don't label the wines with Malbec on the label, they, as is the, the way of French wine. It's labelled by source, by region. So Caor is actually the, the source region of Malbec grape. But it's really become fashionable when sourced and promoted from Argentina. That's the story of Malbec this century. It is Argentina plus this particular grape. Plus, I would add, marbled red meat... Malbec and steak. It's just a great union and it's something that's easy to remember and the wines are good. Now, Malbec did possibly a bit like Chardonnay. Don't worry, I'm being done in a minute. It probably did go a bit far at one stage. Some of the wines are a bit chocolatey, a bit juicy, a bit sweet, particularly for UK palates. I think now they've come back. There's quite a range in styles in Malbec today, so be careful what you, what you source. Maybe Google it, look at the tasting notes. I like them when they're quite floral and they have a lot of red fruits. Some of them now are going more green and peppery, a bit like Northern Rhones, a bit like Cooler Climate Syrah. I think this is a really good halfway house. Um, it's a single vineyard Mar Malbec in the way that Burgundy is, goes towards site specifics. If you look at Pinot from Burgundy, it often names the vineyard, not just the subregion. Malbec from Argentina is taking a similar approach. It's trying to isolate particular sites and single vineyards. They call them parcels here. This, to me, is a stunning example of a very old vineyard. It's been isolated, it's been bottled in this typically Argentine, very heavy bottle, um, to produce, produce something very concentrated, complex, but I think also not overdone. I don't find it too heavy. Again, we need to imagine that we had a, a very rare steak in our in our midst. Sadly, we don't. Um, OK, so that's the Malbec story, a big story. 20 years ago, Malbec wasn't really, didn't really feature in the UK. Now, every shelf, every supermarket has at least three or four wine lists. It's prevalent. The whole steakhouse thing has boomed in this market, and they'll all be showing Malbecs. Why shouldn't the Malbec yeah. in France have a change? Is it because they had... Um, so I was asked the question, why do the Malbec in France not take off? Uh, two answers. One, uh, two reasons, uh, very quickly, but you can ask me more later. One, it wasn't called Malbec. What was it called? Caol, it was named after the region. People didn't know what they were drinking. And secondly was the style. The, uh, it's changing a bit now, but Caol was a bit of a rustic, slightly ordinary wine. And the way, it was particularly a viticultural issue. There were a lot of high-yielding, slightly tannic, slightly tough styles of red. It's changing today. Um, but na naming wasn't called Malbec and style it was quite a hard to, to drink wine it's still a very tannic grape this is why a lot of tannins yes question yeah yeah it's like it, 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 the word just means it's tough to drink basically <laughs> Uh, sorry? No, 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 no. No, no, no. I had like very good Malbec from the south of France and from the south west, and it's not good to drink. It's like very complex. Yeah. And very like nasty. No, no, you're. I'm talking. No, no, you're absolutely right. I'm talking historically. I'm talking historically. Yeah, okay. So, so. So, so let, 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 let's, have the, let's, let, let's have this discussion after the tasting because I don't want to drag everything on. But what I would say is that this year we do every year a blind tasting of Malbecs from all around the world. 
every year Argentina has won. Last year, last year for the first time it was Caor. And it was a wine made by a famous wine consultant called Michel Roland, French, who makes Malbec in Argentina and Caor, and his wine from Caor won. But let's not spend time on that now. I want to finish with something fun. Um, and again, no major development of this century would be complete without touching on Prosecco. So here we are. Yep. Prosecco. Okay, so 10 years ago, I looked up the figures about an hour ago while I was waiting for you guys to come in. 10 years ago, there were in the world produced around 60 million bottles of Prosecco. Last year, last vintage, they made 600 million. That is a tenfold increase. To put it in perspective, Champagne, the most famous sparkling wine region in the world, last year produced about 300 million. So it's the biggest sparkling wine region in the world. It's now producing double the quantity of sparkling fizz coming out of champagne. It is massive. And the reason why it's massive is because we wanted it. We want it. We're drinking a lot of it. And a couple of years ago, we did a story on the drinks business um, forecasting a Prosecco shortage by the summer in the UK. And it was a little story. It was like a 15-minute story we did on our website. It got picked up by The Standard, the BBC, Sky News, everything. And there was a there was a like a run on prosecco in it was like this massive like middle class crisis middle class middling and crisis and everyone ran on it and they, they sold out prosecco so they've planted a lot more the yields have gone up they're making a lot of the stuff now but just to f- really finish prosecco is a great great story we love it we love it for all the right reasons um, it's simple to say it's memorable it's stylistically consistent it comes with a good high base standard um, it's easy to drink it's slightly sweet. Um, it's a lovely, easy-drinking um, uh, fizz. Uh, you don't need a special occasion. It's not hugely expensive. Those are all the reasons why it's been successful. There, it has become a bit like Sauvignon Blanc, a bit prevalent. There's been it everywhere. And a lot of it is sold slightly, you know, on promotion in supermarkets. You go to the same old party. Sometimes it can smell a bit pear droppy, a bit varnishy. It can be a bit disappointing. There is Prosecco, and then there is decent, what we call DOCG Prosecco. It is tied to a particular place. Unfortunately, those places are a bit of a mouthful. Valdo Biadene, Conigliano, is the DOCG that this comes from, really known as Valdo Biadene. There's another DOCG called Azolo, but it's quite a lot of people to remember. But what I would say is look for the G. So DOC Prosecco, they made about 500 million bottles last vintage. DOCG was about 100 million. So it's much smaller. It's from the hilly parts of the Veneto region in northern Italy. And often hand-picked, hilly sites. It makes a more aromatic, more fruity, more complex style of Prosecco, and often a bit drier. These guys, uh, I said years ago, I think this was called, that they were the Krug of Prosecco, and I think they put it on their website. Uh, not to big me up, but it was a, a, I don't even know if it's attributed to me. But they are really considered the Krug of Prosecco. They're called Bizol. They're very quality-minded. They often make drier styles, um, they're very active in the UK market, so they're easy to find. Um, it's a rare example of a premium branded Prosecco that's successful in this market because we are very um, money oriented. It's on your sheet, Bisol, B I S O L. And this is their JO, it's their entry level example. It's a brute style. So most Prosecco you'll see labelled as extra dry. Do you know what that means? Does anyone? Right, less sugar. Okay. So extra dry is actually sweeter than brute. Um, So you can appear sophisticated by buying something a bit sweeter. Um, But actually, extra dry Prosecco, I think, for me, is the sweet spot. I think that sweetness, combined with the floral character of of the grape, actually works very well. But this is a brute style, so it's slightly drier, considered slightly more sophisticated from a very good producer. And I just would urge you to look at Prosecco with fresh eyes. Because it, although it is everywhere, there really are quality differences. Don't always just buy what's on offer. Read around, look out for the good names, the strong brands, and look out for that G, that D-O-C-G, whether it's Valdo Biadeno or Arzolo. Can I ask another question? 
Okay, what I'm going to say is, I'm sure you, I, I hope you all have a few questions. I'm turning on the mic for this because my voice is going to go. They've got to do another masterclass, but I've got to do another masterclass on champagne. So what I'm going to say is, if you have any questions, uh, hold on to them and come and ask me at the end, and I'll answer them as best as I can. And in the meantime, I'm going to sum up because they need to clear the glasses. So all I would say is hopefully you've seen an example of something that maybe you knew before, um, but you've seen it in a new light. I'm hoping you've discovered something fine. I hope, hope in the process I've changed some, some possibly some preconceptions. And also, um, you know, please be open-minded when it comes to how you choose and buy wine. Um, don't assume that your peers or your friends are right on everything. Um, because, you know, here you are, a really great creamy English sparkling. Here you are, a luxury rosé. And here you are, a really fine Prosecco. They're just some of the stories that I wanted to tell you today. Beyond that, please go next door and explore the broad world of wine that's on offer out there. And if you want to ask me any questions, come to the front. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. It was a real fascinating presentation that you gave. So much detailed information about each of the trends that you illustrated and some really delicious wines as well. I've left below links to the Drinks Business website as well as a link to the article that Patrick referenced in his presentation. And of course, I would love to have you following along with me on social media. I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook at wine podcast on twitter and email hello at interpretingwine.com it's just left for me to say a huge thank you to all the team at the wine and spirit show for helping me put this together see you next time